And uh, I want to begin at a, a point which in some ways may seem to be, well, it's one point where, where I can begin, but may seem to be also the most fundamental or primary issue, and that being why there is such a thing as politics at all, or why and in what sense we are political beings. Is being political in some ways and having political institutions, is that somehow essential to, to us as human beings? Uh, could we do without it? Could we imagine ourselves without uh, these institutions or without these practices? Um, or is that somehow built into our nature? Of course, the question arises, is serious, because as we know, 19th century anarchism challenged that assumption that somehow politics is natural or essential to our being. It argued Politics is only the product of historical and contingent circumstances. And then uh, modern, it's the modern right-wing uh, contemporary version of anarchism, the, the cousin of anarchism, right-wing cousin of anarchism, you might say, modern libertarianism, again challenges us and says, why do we need these institutions? Uh, can't we simply reduce them to their very minimum, right? And, uh, be left alone to live our lives. Um, so, is it conceivable that uh, we do away with our institutions and with political activity, or we minimize it in some fashion or other, or is that somehow uh, I impossible because being political is deeply grounded in who we are, in deeply in our nature? Are we naturally political beings? Of course, you might have two different views of uh, 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 the other possibility that we are uh, political only for historical and contingent reason. You might think of it in the way that the anarchists and libertarians do, is that we are, therefore should aim to rid ourselves of politics as far as possible, or minimize it at least. Or you could think that like historical culture, it's a human achievement. Right? and therefore something that we should value as a historical and contingent achievement, that we would want to have as a historical and contingent achievement. So, anarchists and libertarians on one side say it's historical and contingent and we're better off without it, but Aristotle certainly, uh, uh, in, in some ways, but even more prominently Hannah Arendt uh, in, uh, in the 20th century have argued that no, politics is a profound human achievement without which we would be worse off, less human, just as we would be less human if we had no theater or had no uh, art. Um, though it is conceivable that we might be without it. So I want to talk here about, and this is really the theme of my talk today, I want to talk about this question, uh, what we should think about the proposition that we are left political beings by nature. We are naturally <laughs> political beings. And uh, Aristotle is, of course, the primary exponent, maybe the originator of this kind of political naturalism. Uh, the proposition uh, uh, that we are by nature political beings uh, occurs, in fact, in the first book of Aristotle's politics. Um, but there are modern versions of <coughs> political naturalism, too. And they sometimes arise at a surprising place, namely not in philosophy or political theorizing, uh, but in biological theorizing. So sociobiologists and ethologists have in recent years claimed that there are certain biological fixed characteristics about us which inevitably have made us into the political beings we are. So there are two forms of political naturalism that I want to talk about, the Aristotelian one first, and then this sociobiological one, or one particular case of the sociobiological case in the other. Now, Aristotle is interesting because he is, as I said, a political naturalist, but inside this political naturalism, there are also thoughts which in some ways undermine it, or which put it into question, or which raise issues which then lead one to think that maybe the, that our being political is something much more historical and something much more contingent about us than we may have thought. So he, 
you could call that a tension or a contradiction uh, in Aristotelian thought. But it's useful to think about both as an exponent of this naturalistic view of politics and as someone who leads us beyond it. So when, uh, as I said, Hannah Arendt, for instance, uh, very strongly emphasizes this contingent feature of human politics, uh, she is quite deliberately and consciously drawing on Aristotelian conceptions. So let me begin with Aristotle then. Um, as I said, uh, the formula appears in the first book of politics, and uh, uh, as you know, our, our rhetoricians, our orators still on, on uh, uh, special occasions like to kind of quote that formula, namely that man is by nature a political being. Uh, Aristotle, of course, put all this in Greek, uh, as he said, anthropos, fuse, uh, politikon, so on. Uh, so four words, right? And it turns out, in order really to understand what he meant, uh, and whether we still understand it in the way that Aristotle did, uh, one really has to look at each one of these four terms. And it turns out the situation is so much more complex. It's not at all clear uh, that um, uh, we grasp uh, very readily uh, what he was after. And so let me start with the... Uh, so I want to talk, look at each one of these four terms uh, respectively and see what we can get out of it. And let me start with the most general one, namely physics, right? Nature, we say. Um, but uh, Aristotelian nature is not really our nature. So nature for us is something material to begin with, right? Uh, and it's subject to causal necessity uh, and it's governed by mechanical laws, you could say. These are sort of three characteristics that we ascribe to physics, to, to nature, to the physical. But what is physical to Aristotle is, of course, something quite different. Then the, uh, the physical has an inherent, what is natural has an inherent telos or purpose or direction built into it. It's directional, right? Or teleological, we say. And the physical is something that is potential. It has a potentiality which realizes itself or may not realize itself, right? So the acorn, uh, one of uh, Aristotle's examples, so, uh, has the potential become an oak tree. That's its nature, its physics. But of course it may not. Right? If the conditions aren't right, if there's enough water, if it's too hot or too cold, no oak tree. Right? So, so what is, belongs to physics is natural in, this, in some ways. Uh, but it's not natural in the mechanical way. It's not that it's necessarily there. It is there in that it has a potentiality to be some, something. Well, we have this idea that, uh, uh, of course, that somehow the genes are, uh, for instance, in the biological concept, this is a biological conception of nature that, that Aristotle has. And we have still have this picture um, in our own uh, view, namely that particularly when we think of living beings, that there's, there's genes, there are chromosomes, and these somehow determine what the potential organism uh, of the organism is. But of course, for um, uh, for Aristotle, whatever determines this, what is the origin of the fully developed object, is not something material at all. It's not a gene or a chromosome. It's something non-material which attaches itself to the matter, uh, it is what he calls a form. So that every, everything has a form, right? And this form determines what the thing can and will, under the right conditions, become. The important contrast is that between physis and nomos. Right? Physis is, you could say, what can become by itself without human interaction. Nomos, what is by nomos, uh, so we have physics and nomos. Uh, nomos is an interesting word. Physics comes, comes from phio, which, which means to grow, of course. So it has already built in this biological uh, uh, kind of idea. Nomos, I mean that which is not by physics, by nature. Uh, uh, we might say, uh, which exists by custom, 
on culture. So in some ways, Aristotle is making this distinction between nature and culture. Uh, nomos is a, 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 a term that um, whose um, uh, etymology connects, uh, interestingly enough, with uh, uh, most directly with a German verb, nehmen. German, right? Which means to take, right? So nomos is what we acquire, what we take, what we make, what we make up, right? So physis is what comes of itself, by its own, without uh, human intervention, I could say. Whereas what exists by nomos is what requires precisely human intervention, human action. So the oak tree, the acorn, will by itself, under the right conditions, become the oak tree. doesn't require uh, human nurturing necessarily. That's what exists by physics. Whereas what exists by nomos is local, it's made, it's cultural, it doesn't exist all the time. Right? So we are, by nature, that's by physics, he says, Aristotle says, political beings. Which means we are always and inevitably physical, right? Uh, 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 political, sorry, yeah, always and inevitably political. But being always and inevitably political doesn't mean that we actually always and inevitably practice politics, that we actually are active, real, really living in a political world, a real political agent. It only means that we always, and without human intervention, have this potential, and in fact the disposition, to become political when the occasion arises. So, though we are naturally political, this doesn't, for Aristotle, mean that we are necessarily political, right? It only means we are potentially so and this potentiality is given to us. And what, it turns out, what is involved in being political is that we can then, as political beings, create for us culture, customs, and of course also laws, right? So laws, nomos is also a, a word that applies to law, so laws as well are nomos, And so Aristotle ends up, in fact, saying something very paradoxical. He says that we are, by nature, beings of culture. But being cultural or being political, therefore, is part of our nature. Well, let me go to the second word, so, physics, right? So on this is the more specific word. So on means living beings, and as such, uh, living things are distinguished from non-living things by their form, he says, right? Um, and uh, there are different kinds of species, different kinds of organisms, and uh, therefore there are different kinds of living <coughs> beings that have different form, right? And each of these determines a talus, a, a goal, an outcome. So each, each form determines what the thing can potentially be and what under certain conditions it will become. So for us, for our species, our tell us is that we become political. But it turns out uh, there are certain things we share with other uh, human beings, uh, with other living beings. So uh, though we each have, each human species has its own form, nevertheless there are similarities and relationships between these different forms. And so it turns out there are in fact degrees of being political and some other species already are political to some extent. So in, uh, uh, in the politics, in book one again, uh, Aristotle writes, a human being is more of a political animal than a bee or any gregarious animal. So there are degrees of being political. Right? So how are, how are these to be understood? Well, the first thing about being political is that, of course, only gregarious animals, he says, we have a word for that, gregarious animals are political. 
but not all gregarious animals, but we have the gregarious animals. Not all gregarious animals are political, or not all are, are to the same degree. Well, uh, they, they must ful fulfill certain conditions. Uh, namely, the first one, he says, um, are such that, so, so they are also there, of course, they are also the solitary, right? And so some animals are solitary, but we are concerned here only with the, with the gregarious animals. And some gregarious animals are such that uh, they, uh, they kind of move together, they somehow are relate to each other, but in doing so, each one of them is just pursuing its own well-being. And he says, uh, uh, think of uh, fish, right, herrings, all uh, kind of swimming together, but each herring really wants to survive and looking for food, but nevertheless, they all move together. And so this is, uh, uh, they have really no common goal. So there are some animals that, gregarious animals, that just uh, live together in some ways, in close conjunction, but they don't have a common goal, and there is a kind of uh, a more specific form of um, uh, of gregariousness, maybe where the animals uh, have a common goal. Think uh, of some hunting animals uh, going on hunt together, some lions, right? And so they have a, a common goal they pursue, uh, whereas uh, the herrings do not. Things. Fish certainly are not political. Uh, then he says, there are those uh, who um, seem to have um, some kind of social organization. They have a ruler, he says. So they are, uh, have rulers. Uh, for instance, he says, there's the queen bee, right? So there are some, some animals, particularly the gregarious insects, uh, where they are rulers. And then there's a third group uh, who uh, uh, have a... Uh, 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 a common, uh, a shared, uh, I should say, fixed, maybe fixed habitat. So, and these constitute three degrees of being political. So, some animals are only have the common goal. Others have common goal and rulers. Others have common goal to rulers and a fixed habitat. They are more political. And among these here, this third group, are of course the bees again. Uh, that's why he mentions those. And human beings. So we share this form and there are degrees of, of being political. But human beings, of course, have their own distinctive form of life. And so their being political has to be something different again from uh, that of these other animals, they are more political still, and the question is how how is that the, how is that uh, how is that uh, how is that so? Uh, so man is a political animal, human beings anthropos, uh, in a higher degree, he says, than other gregarious animals, even higher than uh, uh, the bees. How is that possible? Well, because we have our own distinctive form. Uh, some characteristic which we share with no other animals, namely a distinctive capacity to use language, logos. And logos, of course, which has many connotations, it means deliberation, argument, reasoning, but also language. Um, logos allows us to reflect on the forms of cooperation and cohabitation in which we engage. So for us, uh, in contrast to the bees who always live under this in the same regime, our political systems are variable. We can reflect on the question, which is better, monarchy, democracy, autocracy, aristocracy, and so on. And we can do that because we have logos. Logos allows us to form concepts, to argue, to reason, to come to make choices. And, and so, uh, we are therefore political in a very different ways from the animals. So he calls it a question of degrees. In fact, it's much more than degree. Here is a really uh, a, a threshold past, right? Uh, uh, but it is logos that makes us uh, the particular kind of political beings we are, because it gives us these choices. Uh, it allows us, he says, 
uh, to distinguish between the good and the bad and the just and the unjust. So he of course says because logos is having logos is what makes us human, therefore we can define a human being as one that has logos, a logicon, so on logicon, right? That's a definition of human being. But because it's logos that makes us also political in the way we are, uniquely so, we can also define human beings as so on politicon. And the two definitions, so so on logicon and so on politicon really come to the same thing. To be political and to be logical is the same thing. Well, let me just uh, add here that, of course, he says at some point, this is in the, at the end of the Nicomachean Ethics, that the highest form of life is, of course, not that of gregarious animals, the human existence, this exist, this political existence at all. The highest form of life is that of pure meditation, because there we are most like the divine. Mm. But, he adds, unfortunately, we are, and this is a wonderful a word here. We are only human. We are only human. And because we are only human, we also have needs and have to take care of these needs. And we can do so only by cooperating with each other. And therefore, though the highest form of existence is that of contemplation, even the sage has to be in some ways a political being. You can't escape being political. Right? So there is something still higher than that. So, human beings have logos, they are, they are political, but again one has to say, having logos is only a potentiality. Right? It's, not, it's something that we are capable of, but it does, doesn't always get fully developed. And so he says, unfortunately, it only gets developed occasionally, to the fullest. So slaves, yes, they can still speak language, maybe they, they know some Greek, for instance, maybe if they're foreigners, know some for broken Greek, right? And so they have some kind of logos, but they don't really have full possession of logos, of reason. <coughs> Children, they don't have language, don't get born with language, and so they don't have logos to begin with, but they have the capacity later to develop logos. And then there are women who do speak Greek, admittedly, but he says they have logos without authority. That is, men just won't listen to them when they speak about politics, right? <laughs> That's natural. Yeah. So it turns out, yes, anthropos, human beings, all have logos, but in fact, most human beings don't have logos to the extent to which they are actually capable of being political at all. It's not even enough to be just a, a free male, a non-slave male, because if you are occupied with practical needs and necessities, you can't really pursue a political existence. And so the only truly political person is a man who is a, a free man to begin with, an educated man who can reason well, but also somebody who is freed from human necessity. He doesn't have to pursue a job. There are those who unfortunately need to work. But they are what he calls banausoi, mechanics, mere mechanics. They can't really do politics. They can't be political. So it turns out though all human beings are distinguished by the fact that they are political beings, only in the rarest of cases can such beings actually actualize their capacity, namely as free, independent uh, uh, human uh, males, maybe even as Greek males, because the others only can say things like bar, 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 <laughs> and called barbarians as a result. Right? <laughs> so, number three, so I've talked about uh, uh, physics, I've talked about uh, Shoni Patzon, uh, I've talked about, um, uh, and, and now uh, talk about uh, an anthropos, what it means to be human, now let me talk finally about politikos, what does he mean by politics? Well, the important point, of course, is here that this word comes from polis, right? And polis is, for uh, the Greeks, certainly for Aristotle and, and for Plato, a very specific kind of institution. We translate polis often as state, 
a complete mistake. A polis is not just any kind of political system. It is a very specific sort of uh, political organization. Uh, we also sometimes say city-state or city, also a mistake, because that comes from civitas. That's a kind of, uh, that's an, uh, an, a Roman expression and refers to a Roman sort of institution. And then sometimes uh, we, for instance, talk about um, uh, the, polite uh, the, the republic, and uh, that uh, famous platonic dialogue, of course, the republic, and that is also a mistranslation because republic, with publica, is once again a Latin word, has nothing to do with the Greeks. Um, uh, and in fact, we would be much better off to have left uh, the title of the Platonic Dialogue untranslated, or if you wanted to have it translated, it would be called somewhat awkwardly, the order of the polis. That's really politeia, that's what it means. So when Aristotle says that man is a political, human beings are a political, are political by nature, what he means is they are naturally polis dwellers. That is, beings who flourish most when they live in the specific kind of structure that the Greek polis approximates. And he says, he who is without a polis, not, not without a state or something like that, but without a polis, by reason of his nature and not of some accident, is either a poor sort of being or a being higher than man. If you're either a god, then you don't need a polis, or you're really a poor sort if you don't need to live in Athens, or some uh, ancient Athens, that is, uh, or some polis of that sort. Right? Uh, we need a polis then to live a really fulfilled human existence. Without that, in other conditions, you can't be human, fully human. Right? Well, he goes so far as to say that the polis uh, because it's so fundamental human existence is in some sense prior, he says, in the order of nature to the household and the individual. And what he means by this is you have to think about human beings in terms of their function and they can't live, they can't function properly outside the polis. And so unfortunately a human being outside the polis isn't fully human uh, uh, in any sense. Which doesn't mean that the polis has always existed. In fact, in the same breath, in the same chapter, he says that the man who f invented the first polis was one of mankind's greatest benefactors. So, polis are rare and don't always exist, but it's only in the polis that we are really political. Let me jump through some of these particular things, my watch here. So what I'm what I've been arguing then is uh, let me uh, kind of summarize this uh, uh, quickly. Uh, on the one hand, Aristotle wants to convince us that being political is completely built into our nature. That as human beings, we are constituted in such a way that it is natural for us to be a political being. But that means that we, in some ways, can strive beyond what is natural too. That is what being political means. And he also says, unfortunately, whether we like it or not, this ear only gets realized in uh, relatively few situations and can be realized in relatively few human beings. Right? That's, that's the nature. So on the one hand, it's completely natural, but it's also completely rare, and it's a historically contingent fact when it occurs. And it has happened to some degree in the Greek polis. And of course, as he is writing this, you might remember um, he, of course, has been one of the teachers of Alexander the Great. The Greek polis as an independent institution is already coming to an end. So he's, in a way, looking backwards. It's a kind of almost nostalgic view on politics. Uh, politics he has. He's looking backwards and he sees this great potential for a form of human existence which is already at the point of disappearing. Well, let me jump uh, very radically then at this point uh, uh, to, to the moderns. And I will uh, talk simply about one, one particular person, namely uh, the Dutch uh, ethologist or so sociobiologist, if you want. Um, the terms are somewhat uh, malleable here. Uh, uh, famous uh, researcher of primates, uh, Franz de Waal. Uh, who um, uh, some years ago wrote a book 
called chimpanzee politics. And uh, this was based on a, a, a large amount of uh, animal research at the uh, z z zoo at Arnhem in the Netherlands, um, where he observed the behavior of various uh, groups of chimpanzees. And he concluded that these people live uh, in a way uh, which uh, justifies saying that there is um, that they are really capable of political behavior in a in a elementary uh, sort. Uh, what makes them political? Not that they lived in a polis, of course, right? And of course, they didn't uh, know how to speak to each other. What makes them political is rather something quite uh, else. I mean, what he said he observed was that not only were there interactions, binary interactions between uh, a particular uh, chimpanzee individuals. But uh, at which were quite complex. I mean, they would extend over long ter term. These chimpanzees would recognize each other as individuals. They would be in hostile or friendly relationships with each other. They would fight with each other or cooperate with each other, delousing each other, and so on. So there are many of these uh, multiple binary relationships. But he said that's not what's interesting. What is interesting is that there are many occasions when some third animal will intervene in the interactions between the two others. We have to think of here of a process of triangulation. And the characteristic of human politics, of all politics, is in fact such triangulations. It's intervening in the interactions of others. Well, if you want a simple uh, illustration of this, think of um, uh, participants in, uh, in a traffic behavior, right, uh, on the road, and so there are all kinds of interactions between the individual drivers, uh, but that is not political. What is political is the lawgiver, for instance, through the police insisting on uh, certain kinds of behaviors between these, uh, preventing, try seeking to prevent some, and seeking to uh, encourage others. So triangulation is of the nature of politics. That was uh, de Waal's uh, interesting observation. And I think there is something interesting in this, which Aristotle certainly uh, did not understand. Um, well, clearly there, I mean, uh, uh, de Waal describes this in great detail. It's a very interesting book to read. It's not very philosophical, of course. It doesn't want to be. Um, but uh, it, it does seem to tell us something about politics, but it's immediately clear uh, de Waal is speaking a completely different language from Aristotle. Uh, uh, his political animals are primates and not gregarious insects. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, there's a good reason for this, because from our modern biological point of view, uh, gregarious insects are far too far uh, distanced from us on the evolutionary ladder uh, to have anything in common with us as political beings, whereas the primates are immediately related to us. But of course, Primate behavior is quite different from that of the gregarious insects, where the gregarious insects live in these tightly structured social arrangements with each other. Uh, uh, the primates live in very informal arrangements and uh, that in fact make possible this constant intervention and this constant transformations of uh, binary relationships. So a completely different notion of politics uh, that arises here. Duval has been uh, criticized for, for this uh, uh, idea and saying uh, from sort of an Aristotelian minded so other sociobiologists saying uh, what uh, he doesn't describe is the I interaction between um, uh, organisms who are not direct kin, they're not related to each other and that are live together in very large groupings um, and so sort of kind of Aristotelian minded uh, uh, kind of objection to him but I think he nevertheless he does uh, say something that is of interest here. But nevertheless, of course, there is also important uh, differences here. Uh, so, um, there are, interestingly enough, I mean, one of, I mean, this is one of, may be one of the problems of his account, he is uh, willing to uh, interject into his descriptions of the animal behavior a whole large body of um, uh, terms that are borrowed from human political language. He speaks about uh, these chimpanzees being 
involved in economic exchanges, for instance, or forming coalitions that he says that they are capable of strategic planning and within a system of power relations and so on. He, said he allows himself a whole uh, wide range of anthropomorphic language uh, which should make one feel somewhat suspicious. Uh, he goes so far as to say that uh, these chimpanzees, and I quote here, would obviously feel very much at home in a political arena. And that surely can't be true, right? can't be true, because for one thing, uh, these animals, um, though they may engage in some kind of power uh, interaction of domination, uh, and some kind of uh, play dom domination roles, uh, in fact, much of the Val's book is concerned with power struggles between these different chimpanzees. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it, it, we can't say, as de Waal says, that this produces a logical coherence and even a democratic structure, he says, uh, to the community of chimpanzees. Um, let me quote one more sentence. All parties search for social significance and con continue to do so until a temporary balance is achieved. This balance determines the new hierarchical positions. When we see how this formalization takes place during reconciliations, we understand that the hierarchy is a cohesive factor which puts limits on competition and conflict. Child care, play, sex, and cooperation depend on the results and stability, but underneath the surface, the situation is constantly in a state of flux. Um, and he says, well, that's just exactly how Machiavelli talks about politics. And so, chimpanzee politics is not just a, a metaphor, it's really something already in our pre human forebears, uh, where the foundations, the genetic foundations, so to say, of our political existence are laid. But of course, you might say, what is really missing from this? Um, uh, and that's uh, 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 where I think Aristotle um, uh, gets the better on him, is that what he doesn't see, that these animals, of course, could not partake in any real politics because they don't speak any language. They don't have any language. And they are therefore not capable of doing exactly uh, what Aristotle says is characteristic and definitive of human politics. I mean, they are not capable of reflecting on the social interactions in which they are engaged and think about them, conceptualize them, and assess them in some ways, and then on the basis of this assessment make choices about them. Right? So they cannot debate on whether a democracy uh, is better than the other or whether the <coughs> alpha a uh, male chimpanzee shouldn't be got rid of and replaced by a council of matriarchs. Uh, and, right, they, they are not in a position to uh, make such deliberations. And so they are really not capable of uh, being political in the Aristotelian sense at all. And I think here Aristotle has seen something which is indeed uh, absolutely essential to human politics, that politics is above all uh, human politics about uh, about language or involves above all language. It's a linguistic phenomenon, you might almost want to say. Well, nevertheless, I think uh, uh, one should take the world seriously and uh, sociobiologists like him, um, and there are many others who write in the same vein, um, uh, because uh, there is a tendency in uh, contemporary political theory, not so much in, among philosophers who are focused on these prescriptive normative issues, but among political theorists, uh, whom you typically find uh, in America, at least in political science departments, not in philosophy departments, uh, to take, uh, uh, to, to consider political theory kind of freestanding, self-contained enterprise, right? Uh, William Connolly, for instance, has uh, complained about this and said, no, we have to really see that uh, uh, however human politics is conceived, it's, we are natural and biological beings, and that biological fact about us bears in some important fundamental way uh, about who, uh, uh, on who we are. Uh, Conrad Lawrence once observed, uh, and I think rightly and, and, and very uh, perspicuously, that uh, in evolution, the old uh, is rarely discarded um, uh, in the evolutionary and historical process, but its function is maybe transformed. So there are many 
features about us, think of the human appendix, let's say, as uh, one expression of this fact. Even non-functional elements or minimally functional elements in our organism are maintained in the evolutionary process. And so we should therefore say the same thing is probably also true when it comes to human behavior, human action. There too, uh, the biological uh, or biological facts about us uh, which we can observe already in pre-human populations uh, will have a bearing on how we should think about ourselves as deliberate, conscious human agents. So, uh, Lawrence, this is in uh, 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 his book, um, Die Rückseite des Spiegels, uh, behind the back of the mirror, I think it's called in English. Um, I says, look at human cognition, right? And uh, here, uh, cognition in general, and what he tries to argue is that our cognitive machinery is actually a composite, evolutionarily speaking, of many separate elements who have grown together uh, syncretistically, and we can understand what they are and how they function only by seeing them as products of this process which contains many a contingent feature, so the current structure of the apparatus is not that it is the most appropriate uh, uh, for survival purposes, but uh, the structure of the apparatus has to be understood as the outcome of a process of development of which many steps and traces of earlier phases are still retained in the end. So there is in consequence no inherent necessity he has maintained in the particular assembly of capacities that constitute the human cognitive apparatus. Only an evolutionary and historical uh, account uh, can tell us uh, why that apparatus has now for us uh, uh, the, the current form. So the crucial point is that we will not be able to discern the construction of our cognitive machinery without attending to the history of its formation. We can illustrate this kind of uh, thinking also by uh, reflecting not on evolutionary processes but on historical processes. And think of any of the great uh, European cathedrals. Right? And what you observe, of course, is that they have been all built uh, over centuries sometimes. I know, for instance, that the um, great Gothic cathedral in Cologne was started sometime. Uh, well, well, there are many, many. Uh, um, earlier uh, constructions there in the place, but uh, as a Gothic cathedral, sometime in the 13th century, and was completed only in the 19th century, right? So, uh, 600 years of construction, and what you observe, of course, when you look around in these cathedrals, that there are all kinds of different pieces and styles put together. Design has sometimes changed the shape of the thing. The ground plan has been adjusted over time. Different architects have done their work with different aesthetic uh, ideals in mind and so on. Um, and the result of this process uh, can sometimes be jarring even. One has to say you know, not all these cathedrals are always that harmonious, but many of them have still come out in an interesting way, right? Uh, what we admire maybe in the finished building is its organic unity. Right? It's precisely that uh, it starts off Romanesque and it ends up Gothic, right? Uh, uh, several hundred years later. And that, that is what makes it so interesting and what makes it the thing that it is, right? It is itself a record of a history. Right? And uh, a cathedral is not just an aesthetic production, it's a historical monument and a historical evidence of the persistence of tradition and religion over time. That's what it symbolizes, right? not just an aesthetic value. So, um, exactly the same, I think, can be said about human politics. Human politics, too, is the result of a process uh, that has formed over a very long time that has indeed biological, natural, pre-human, non-human components in it, and we can't understand it without it. What we understand as politics has come together from different sources and been aggregated over time, uh, and in the evolutionary historical development, elements have been added, 
and subtract it. And in this way, the structure of human politics, or what we now have as our political reality, has been slowly enriched and has become both problematic in the way it is and amicable in the way it is, sometimes it is that. Um, in this way, the structure of human politics is slowly enriched. None of this will be immediately apparent to the untrained eye, to the unhistorical eye. We, we may note, for instance, that of course action is uh, basic to politics. Uh, not all politics is about action, because it's also about structures, institutions, right? realities. Um, uh, but we may, uh, uh, but what we call an action, human action, is of course itself a peculiar amalgam of physiologically determined patterns of behavior. So they are, in some sense, uh, genetically fixed and uh, these genetic uh, determinations may come from pre-human sources. Uh, some of what we call action is due to acquired conditioned reflexes. Uh, some to childhood fixations, habituations, conscious learning, deliberate choice, uh, uh, and um, appropriately descriptive language that interprets all of this. All this so, uh, in human action too, when we think of human action, the way we think, to reflect on it and describe it is itself a constituent element of the action. So actions, as I understand, are not elementary phenomena that you could analyze by purely logical means. They are outcomes of an evolutionary and historical and developmental process and contain within them as features all these residues of all these stages of the historical process, of the temporal process. So just as in the case of human cognition, or that of European cathedrals, it will prove difficult to distinguish the different layers and levels of the mechanism of action unless we consider the temporal processes through which they have come to be formed. Here too, in other words, the successful understanding of existing structures requires a study of evolutionary and human history. But since actions are constitutive parts of our political reality, the same must, of course, hold for the latter as well. The sociobiologists, the ethologists, I think, understand this, and what they say about the evolutionary basis of human politics is surely of interest. But they typically neglect the later phases of this process in which human politics has come to acquire its distinctive character. Having traced part of the history of this process, history in the broad sense we're involved in, including evolution, having traced part of the history of the process, the sociobiologists are believed to have discovered all of it. But they think that by looking at the way that animals, primates, let's say, behave, and then comparing that, seeing relations from there to human political behavior, they have now understood human political behavior, mm. and the same in every other aspect of human life. Right? That's, that's the, where the mistake occurs. They in, neglect, in fact, the most distinctive feature of the historical evolution of human politics. Namely, they fail to discern what Nietzsche, for instance, saw. Namely, that human politics is not a natural kind. It's not itself a biological a natural phenomenon, it is constituted only by our interpretation of these natural phenomena. And I'll come back to that. Uh, in the, the genealogy of morals, there is a, 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 a fascinating and shocking uh, sentence uh, which says, there are no moral phenomena. There is only a moral interpretation of phenomena. And what you might just say, oh, this is just moral nihilism, right? But I, I think that's a mistake. What he is saying is what we think of as the moral is, is not there in the bare facts of, for instance, human suffering uh, or human cruelty or whatever. 
what we think of as the moral has to do with how we interpret, what sense we make of this phenomenon. And I think that's the point he elaborates very clearly in, for instance, the um, second essay of the genealogy of morals. So, so I'm saying here, Nietzsche understood something about the nature of morality, but, but can you apply that also? And I think he under, understood that to apply also to politics. That politics does not consist in us fighting with each other or collaborating with each other or doing this or that with each other. The nature of human politics is our capacity of interpreting and making sense in some ways of these facts about ourselves. Right? So I could, you could call this a hermeneutic conception of, of morality and of politics. And what I'm saying is, or what I have been saying here, is that the sociobiologists, much as they are interesting as they may be, um, our, our current sort of reductionist tendency to think about everything in, uh, in, uh, in these biological and reductive terms. What they miss out is precisely this uh, insight which I have attributed here to Nietzsche. But I think it's an insight which is already in some ways there in Aristotle. That's why I've been talking about Aristotle. Because when Aristotle says what's distinctive on human politics is that we are logical beings, right? That we are beings who reflect on and can judge and deliberate about political matters. That's really where the essence of human politics lies. Right? So human politics is what it is only because we have given it a specific meaning. This meaning changes over time, of course. Politics becomes something new over time. It acquires new meanings. And these meanings may also lose their force over time. And then we need to give them new meanings if we can. Uh, and we may also fail in uh, being able to do that. Uh, and at that point, of course, politics may become impossible for us to maintain. So uh, what I want to talk, this is uh, what I have to say today. What I want to talk uh, about on, on, on Wednesday now is this question, um, uh, in what sense has the meaning of politics disintegrated for us? And I want to say, What's fundamental to our political situation today is really, in, I mean, there, there are many, many practical problems. We have, uh, uh, some very local, specific, but then also these broad questions of modern technology, environmental question, climate, population, and so on. Um, uh, these are practical questions. But beyond that, what is really bothering us, what is really ailing us, is that we have lost any coherent sense of what politics is really about that there was once for us in our culture such an understanding, that this has disintegrated, and that we are now at one of these moments when if we want to be political beings, we have to find a new way of interpreting our own reality, our own human reality. That's the challenge. And I, I, what I want to argue is that it was Nietzsche who first really understood that this is the task of contemporary politics. <coughs> 